Welcome to uh, our uh, first lecture of the, of the May, uh, Master of Interaction. <laughs> the first, but not the last. <laughs> and thanks, Julius Pop. We are really glad to, to have you here and really proud for acceptance of our, our invitation. Julius Pop was born in Nuremberg, Germany. He studied at the, I'm sorry, uh, Horst Schule für Graphic and uh, Buchskunst in Leipzig. And he won the Robot Choice Award in uh, 2003. The Frankhofer Institute in Bonn and the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT have both studied elements of Pop's work, which made unique advances in the field of artificial intelligence. He develops interdisciplinary works in which art and science converge that are as simple in their structure and perceivable to the senses as they are complex and technologically sophisticated. An example of Pop's work, and I suppose everyone has, has seen it, is Bitfall in 2005, a machine which displays words selected from the internet via drops of falling water in precise configuration, each word visible only for a second. Or the, another project, Bitflow, which shows that navigating through the modern world is no longer linear. The thread can no longer serve as a model to describe it. You will see as, as dozens of small particles make up a chaotic swarm of bits. So uh, I think you will enjoy it. And uh, let's begin. Thanks, Julius. Before I start, I'm always nervous when I have to talk, and I'm not very good in talking with microphones. So you have to be very patient with me, and sometimes I fail and give lectures. It might be that I suddenly stop, and then you have to help me to recover where I lost myself. Um, my title, the title of the talk is called Form and Meaning, and I'm not going to explain it now, but during the talk, I think you will find the way that I try to explain the world to myself with different elements. And the first, first five minutes will be very complicated and I have to concentrate very well. Um, the first section is called Space, Environment and Perception. And I start with an image that NASA gave us two years ago. And they have sent a robot to Mars. And what you see here is a photo that the rover made and at the bottom line, you have the horizon of the Mars, and there's an arrow, and the arrow is pointing to the Earth. And this image tells us, of course, where we are, and it implements for me that we know what we do. I will come back to this image in a, in a minute later. Because I, uh, that's, I already lost myself. So I start here again. Uh, we see an image from Mars. Humans have achieved that we can send out rockets and send them to Mars and make images from the world. And this implements for me that we know exactly what we do and we know who we are. Um, this is part of a process where we explain the environment in which we live in. Um, one part of this environment is nature. Okay, I'm, we skip this introduction. <laughs> it's all theoretically stuff and I always lose myself and I, I reflect too much on what I do right now here. So I say we are able to see us, ourselves from Mars and we are able to loco locate ourselves in the universe but I, I doubt that we know who we are. And this introduction is about why I doubt this but my works will explain this during the course of the talk. And the first piece is that I explain that the world model changed over the last hundreds and thousands of years. The way humans explain the world themselves is always depending on an image they create of the environment in which they live in. And here you see an, an image from the 16th century and there's a guy, he's a missionary, he claimed that he was able to walk to the end of the world and that he could stick his head through the hemisphere and look at the gears of the universe. And you can clearly see that the Earth is flat 
the sun is turning around the earth and human humans are the center of the universe that was one image in the 16th century and at the same time people already knew that the earth must be a sphere <clears throat> the greek um, already knew 2500 years ago by watching ships when they left the harbor the way the ships um, disappeared that the bottom of the ship disappears first and the sails and then the top of the mast is the last thing that you can see led to the idea that the earth must be a spherical shape and we are on top of a sphere and we have a limited vision which is due to the curve of the earth and in the year 2005 I said to myself this image does not fit anymore to our modern world because if we can see from any point of the world to any other point of the world with mobile devices or with internet or via satellites with technology we have to change this image because I have lost this horizon line and I was looking for an image that could explain or update this worldview and I offered this version which is a new world model for me and as you can see I'm standing inside spheres and standing inside means that you can look from any point in this world model to any other point there's no horizontal limit <clears throat> what is also very important in this image is that I have a closed vision um, I'm standing inside a structure that explains the world to me and all these small parts these wooden parts um, make up a closed world model that's what people always tend to do that they explain the world um, for example in the medieval ages when we could not explain thunder and lightning we had an image that God will um, punish somebody and he throws down thunder and lightning lightning and thunder can you can you follow me so yeah. and a few hundred years later we knew okay if clouds collide they produce electricity and then uh, a thunder goes down and we have uh, lighting and this stuff and we can explain it differently so our, our view changes the way we explain the world to us is changing due to the knowledge we have around our world and the knowledge that I have is expressed by the wooden um, parts that are surrounding me and for me it was a big step because I found out that the structure that is holding all these wooden parts is something that I cannot see that I cannot feel and I started to question myself <clears throat> um, where where is the structure can I explain it can I grab it and how does this work okay <clears throat> today I'm confused and we have to wander through all these pieces <laughs> and maybe in the end you ask me questions <laughs> but let's see <clears throat> it, it was my diploma piece and at the day um, all the people and my professors who were judging me were around the sculpture and the sculpture is 360 3 meters 60 high so nobody could look inside and <clears throat> they asked me why why don't you present uh, us the inside because the inside must be very nice because the shape from the outside suggests uh, that it's a very harmonic and aesthetically inside and said yeah uh, the that is a big problem because we can never can see both sides at the same time and that day the newspaper of Leipzig published a large image of the inside of the thing and I asked the professors did you look at the newspaper today did you inform yourself did you update your the information you percept every day because then you could have already seen the inside of the piece and um, at the same time this is a I want to explain that the information we percept all the time is building up this structure give me a second <clears throat> uh, 
Um, I try to continue. It's crossroads. <clears throat> so we have this. You have seen me sitting inside or standing inside the sculpture, and we saw the outside. And now I try to explain. We are preoccupied by information, or we are. I'm missing the word. I don't know. And the next piece I'm going to present, I'm going to switch now, is that I ask the question, can I explain where information is originating, where it's coming from, what is the main source? And I was looking into artificial intelligence to find out if people could explain the process of making sense, where they have data coming in and they have a process of artificial intelligence and they have a machine that, that's acting intelligent afterwards. And what I found is like many humanoid robots in the scientific world. And when you see a humanoid robot that's acting and moving his head and rolling with the eyes and um, opening its mouth, you always have the feeling straight away that this machine must be intelligent because it behaves like a human. But that's a failure. Every time we see a puppet or we see a, a machine that's acting like a human, we think it has the capability of our brain, that it can percept the way we percept and that it can make sense like we can make sense, or that it has emotions. That's just a psychological trick um, scientists use sometimes to make you believe that they have found something very important. Mm -hmm. But I doubt this. And at the time where I do, was doing my research, I said, maybe this is the wrong way to do science on artificial intelligence. And maybe I can propose something different. If I think long enough about the problem and I ask myself, is it the right way, what, how can I do it? I probably will find a system that can, uh, that can help me to do research on artificial intelligence or on the way we make sense. And therefore, I, it took me over one year of just thinking. And I thought, OK, if I don't understand complex systems, I should use a very simple system. So I started to look for the most simple system that I could imagine that would consist only one dimension of environment, one dimension of acting, and one dimension of sensing. And if I get these three dimensions um, in a system that makes sense in the end, then I would call it intelligent. <clears throat> and therefore I propose these two robots um, they are circular in design, and they are mounted on two ball bearings, which means the circle can rotate freely on these ball bearings and is only exposed to gravity. Gravity is the only environmental dimension they have. On the right side, you see micro atom. Um, I can also show you these. Here, micro atom is on the left side. He has only one arm. And if he's moving this one arm, the weight point of the robot gets shifted, and therefore the whole body tries to find a new balanced position in gravity. And the only sense it has is the rotational, like a gyroscope. So you have these three components, gravity, one-dimensional action, and one-dimensional sensing. And now the question is, how does this robot make sense because it starts off as not knowing anything about its environment and it does not know anything about its own body. It's like a baby which is born into a brand new world. And I thought if I ship these robots to the MIT <clears throat> or to the Fraunhofer Institute or different universities in the world, they would come back with a program which does exactly what, what I was trying to find. But I had to find out that nobody would solve this problem. There's a list of maybe 10 or 12 points, um, like the program must not know anything about the body, the program must not know anything about the environment. And these points, if you put them together, what you expect from a human baby when it's born, which is learning how to move its body, who is learning to interact with the environment, um, these problems, from my point of view, are not solved yet. There are many programs which can make this robot do what they're doing right now, but I would never call them intelligent. <clears throat> and 
the next step I took is because I found out that I didn't found anything out I built a new machine which is doing the same but looks totally different um, and here you see a tube it's transparent and I have two different liquids one is colored and one is transparent in the machine the robot this is the body of the robot and the action the robot can take is just press one button and each time he's pressing the button he's injecting one black liquid droplet of liquid which is then cycling through the tube and now the goal, goal is that the robot is looking with a video camera at his own body and he has to understand what he's doing he has to plan or he has to find out that every time he's pressing a button there's a small little drop injected in the tube and it's cycling all the way through the thing and I said to myself, if the machine is able to understand what it's doing, it must be able to inject signs or form, forms, make patterns inside this tube. And actually, we are looking at one pattern, but we are looking from a different perspective, not from the perspective of the robot's vision. And if we are flying around this three-dimensional body, we suddenly enter the perspective of the machine and we find out that there is a line in it and we can only see the line from the perspective of the robot and any other perspective only shows us data and there's a specific thing that we sometimes look at data and we cannot read any information out of it because we are missing the right perspective when we look at things and if we shift our viewpoint we sometimes get a di different angle to, to look at the same object and we suddenly realize what we are looking at. <clears throat> Here you have the machine, it's quite old, I think it's 2005 or 2004. You have a table with a tube on top. Above the table is a camera. Inside the stainless steel box is a complicated ap apparatus, machinery. And I have a very boring five minute movie <clears throat> that ex explains it. I just fast forward it. Again, you have different uh, philosophical points that the body is able to change and the machine still is able to cope with the changes. And again, for me, this is a very important point. Um, here you can see the motion tracking algorithms. That, that's not important, but here... You cannot see it very good. If you... These lines are the points just... It doesn't matter. Maybe we, if somebody has a question later, we can come back to it. This is what, what I wanted to say. If we can measure our brain waves, and we can see, okay, there's activity in the brain, but we cannot read what the people think. We cannot say how he's feeling. We can just say there's activity in specific areas, but we cannot read the data and say these are his thoughts. And it's the same with this machine. <clears throat> Do you want to know something more about it? Yes, I, I tell you a little bit more. And I try not to get in too deep of the theory. The machine should learn to operate its own body and should produce signs or forms like a line or like a cross or like uh, letters <clears throat> one question is what would this letter or form express and in terms of this machine it does not express anything because the meaning for the machine is completely missing it's just repeating a process and it's forming forms but there's no meaning with the machine this process of 
making sense or making producing meaning to it is not here. But what is very interesting, it once it has this form, it can store it and it, could, it can reproduce it. And if you have a second machine, which is doing exactly the same, these machines can pass patterns in between and ask the other machine, can you reproduce the same patterns that I can do? But that is not, um, uh, not I mean, if you look at the, the body, the tube has specific areas in which it can print and it cannot print in different areas where there are not tubes. So these two machines are negotiating on science they could exchange and they could add value to. Oh, it's complicated, I mean, it doesn't matter. <coughs> because this is also complicated and I lose myself and I cannot explain it very well when there are too many people in front of me. I can clearly explain it when there are only two people. <coughs> I help myself and I say to myself, okay, I can build machines and I don't need to talk. And I show you different machines that express the same thing which the other machines try to explain in a scientific way. So I use the same technology. I take transparent tubes and I write words that you can understand. And here, just the explanation in the beginning, in the middle of the image, you can see an A. Not, not all people see it at the beginning. <clears throat> and if you look at this movie, it's in motion. And there have been two philosophers, Foucault and Deleuze, and they have said in modern times the thread of the Ariadne is cut into pieces. Does everybody know the Greek mythology of Ariadne? Ariadne? The, uh, the thread of the Ariadne? Theseus uh, came to the island and Ariadne gave him a red thread and Theseus was wandering into the maze in this labyrinth and killed the Minotaurus. And every person who has entered the labyrinth before was killed by the Minotaurus or never found back out because it is this confusing structure. And Deleuze and Foucault said in modern times, this red thread is lost. It's cut into many little pieces and we humans have to make our own thread. Each individual has to um, find his own red thread in life and there's no predefined way that we can follow. And this is the image that I propose as something you can look at and maybe you feel something. And it's the same, there's the same philosophical points or technical points inside. If this red drops enter the system, you're not able to read the letter. Only when they reach this spot in the middle, the form is in a way that you can read a letter. And every other point of the system, the data is the same, but the form is different. Therefore, we should notice that our perception of how we perceive the world is very narrow. And there are different sizes of the machine. Um, here you can see the complete system. It's a kind of oil and it's a kind of colored liquid. And because they have different weights, they separate like uh, vinegar and oil and of salad sauce. And you have two pumps and some special valves, uh, which took lots of work to design them. And the words in both cases that were written in the beginning are frustration. That's what char characterizes me the most. I think that I'm always frustrated because I always 99% I fail with my work and only the hundredth step is some, some achievement. <clears throat> and you can scale it and you can form different aesthetical settings. But I'm not so interested in the aesthetics or in the size, but only in the... I only want to prove my idea and the smallest machine would be good enough for me, but probably nobody would buy it or look at it, or I don't know. <clears throat> I 
just have mentioned that our perception is very ner narrow in what we can decode. And the next piece is more into this very specific part that we can read. Um, the piece is called Bit Code. It was a title work of the show Decode in the Victoria Albert Museum, sponsored by SAP. And if, if you're a machine, you can read barcodes very well. <clears throat> Humans cannot read barcode very well. But what you see here in each magenta colored rectangle is the same data represented in different graphical signs. Each box is expressing the same data in a different graphical way. And if I now slowly move up this um, system of recoding the same set of data, there's one point suddenly where it can read the word, its resolution. And every other graphical representation is completely unreadable or un understandable for us. And resolution is here, of course, the screen resolution or the resolution what we can in the scale in which we can percept. But there's also a poem by a German writer called Bertolt Precht. It's called The Resolution der Kommunaden. And it's about uh, just before the French Revolution where people say, okay, we, we prefer to die than to keep on living in the system we had. And we have to break, we have to break out. And for me, it's, I see my limitations when I see this piece. <clears throat> I can feel that what I personally can percept is very small. And I want to break the system. I want to get out of my own limitations, but I can't. <clears throat> the piece here is nine meters wide. It's 96 chains, and each chain has the same black and white pattern. And now I just move the chains up and down to rearrange the black and white patterns. And now you can read in the lower middle the word Obama. And it keeps on writing words over and over. And it's creating a carpet of cultural fragments. And if you look at the language systems that we have, we have 26 Latin letters, and we can rearrange them in any way we want. I can create any word, no problem. But the problem occurs if I want to communicate with this word to you, I say a word that you probably have never heard before, and you won't understand me, because I just invented this word made out of these letters. And this piece also made me aware that there's a very long negotiation process on words or forms that we have agreed on culturally to express ourselves. So, and when we want to express something new, we need some new word or new agreement on one set of form to be able to communicate about it. Should I go faster, or are you, are you still with me, or are you tired? <clears throat> and probably many of you have seen this next movie. It's a movie from two scientists from the United States. It's about selective awareness. Do you know this movie? What you see here are two teams of basketball players. One team is wearing white t-shirts and the other one is wearing black t-shirts. And I would like to ask you to concentrate on the white team and you have to count how many, how often they pass the ball. And you have to be very, very um, concentrated on the white team passing the ball. And you only have to count how many times they pass the ball.
this is also a, a problem that the screen is so big. If it's smaller, many people don't see it. How many, how many of you saw the black gorilla? Did, did everybody see it or not? <clears throat> okay, this, this is due to the big screen. But usually, 50% of the people don't see it. <clears throat> she, okay, it's... I, I didn't see it in the first time. And again, this is, this is an example that totally shocked me when I was looking at it and I did not see the gorilla and afterwards the scientist who presented this test to me told me that there's a gorilla in it and I no. <laughs> <clears throat> so why, why I showed this movie is um, that I feel the importance to, I have to emphasize that we have to understand our own brain and how we percept the world and that there are big limitations and um, the system of the brain is very complicated and has its own order. And when I was growing up I thought, okay, this is me, I'm here, and this is the world and it is like it is. But today I think differently and the more I understand about the brain, I get more and more shaken and insecure. And there are more things that are very tricky about it. For example, that my me, when I say, okay, I need to go to the toilet, or I take the decision to go to the toilet, or to eat something, I always thought this would be a conscious decision that I take, that is made out of my me, that I have a personal choice. But some scientists found out that this decision was taken maybe 20 milliseconds before I even noticed that I'm going to decide this. So for me, I, I try to express more and more how I'm interacting with the world, how I percept information and how I communicate again based on the facts that I know about my brain. And my main theme is information, what I percept and what I, what I give away. And the piece with the red drops, which you saw in the beginning, was just one metaphor of one, one piece that is explaining the nature of information. And another criteria is a lifetime of information. I'm talking, I'm talking complicated. Each, each of these pieces is trying to grab one specific characteristic of information. And the next one, before what you probably know, is about the lifetime of information. How long is information valid for us? Um, can, I, can I stop the process of information? Can I hold the words? Or <clears throat> and it's a very simple machine, actually. It's made out of small valves in a specific size with a specific nozzle. And they just deploy drops of water. <clears throat> and in the end I can write words with it that fall down and you can see two cycles one is a cycle of nature like the rain that always rains down and is um, collected in rivers and lakes and vaporizing up again in the sky and raining down and the second cycle is a cycle of nature that the words that appear are always changing <clears throat> this video was taken for the MoMA um, they wanted to exhibit the piece, but they were afraid that I'm going to ruin their wooden floor. Therefore, they asked me to make a video, which is dry. The words that you can see here, like in any other piece that I do, are drawn from the internet. I've written a program that is reading news websites every day, every 15 minutes, and it's just taking the words of different news websites and it's counting the appearance of each word on the website. And it's putting these words in a database. 
And then I say, okay, which, which words appear over a hundred times or over two hundred times? Like he, she, me, you. These words are redundant. It's redundant information that we don't need to understand what's happening in the world. So I just skip these words and I only use words which appeared maybe three to seven to nine times. It's a very simple statistical rule. <clears throat> I prefer this movie, it's shorter and it shows more people are attracted by the piece. And for me it's also very important. One key characteristic is shown here is that if I try to grab the information, if I hold my hands into the waterfall, I cannot grab the information, I only get wet hands, but the word disappears. It's the same as if I talk and the moment the words leave my mouth, I have no more control about it. <clears throat> and the, the program which is um, drawing the words from the net each day is also making um, lithographies and here you can see eight days and this is German information and if I look at as a German person as if I look at these pages I can clearly recall each day just by these 12 words the second page for example you have the world Amoklauf it's a guy who ran through Germany and shot 17 people and his name was Tim K and the town was Winnenden so 12 words are enough to recall a complete day. The page below, you might probably also remember, <clears throat> it's Mumbai terrorists, India, Bombay, Pakistan. It's bomber attacks or the terror attacks to the hotels in Mumbai. And I want to go deeper into one example. Here you can see two days and it says Hamas, Israel, Gaza Strip, and the next day it changes to Israel, Gaza Strip, and Hamas. So the priority changed just within one day. And if you look at it over the course of a week, you have three lines. Red is Hamas, blue is Gaza Strip, and green is Israel. <clears throat> and this is the the war when Israel went into the Gaza Strip for three days and cleaned some Hamas terrorists. It's a com complicated topic, but it, Israel, Israelis went into the Gaza Strip and did something. And before the outbreak of the war, you have the three words wandering in a random noise. It was just now and then in the news, but nobody would draw attention to it. One day before the war, or two days before the war, there's a spike it's the first indication that there's happening something, that there's gonna happen something. And then you have the outbreak of the war, which goes up, and then it goes down again very fast. And after a week, it's back to random noise. And the problem between Israel and the Hamas and the Gaza Strip is not solved. It's a big question of how, how the media system and humans or cultures treat problems key problems of our society and how we solve these problems. And if you ask why newspapers only present this information when it's really burning, there's a very simple reason in capitalism. If the newspaper is not presenting news in English, it's very literally news, nobody would buy the newspaper because everybody would be bored. Those has a direct link between um, capitalistic system and how we deal with with problems in the world and how we spread information about it. And if you show this curve to a biologist, he says this is a saturation curve of a neuronal system. And then I get chicken skin again and say how, how can it be that there's such a direct link between our biology and the capitalistic and the media system and all these cultural things. The next piece is um, about the epiphany, um, that you suddenly realize something. You have been looking at the same thing for over weeks and you did not, 
you could not read anything, you could not um, grasp what you were looking at. And suddenly you have this, aha, I understand it now. It is a proposal for Frank O'Gary, who was building a new skyscraper in Los Angeles. And I tried to adapt to his way of making architecture and integrate my own way of making, working with information. And what you see here is uh, two spheres made out of stainless steel pyramids. And the sun would shine on these spheres <clears throat> and the triangles would reflect light. And the way they reflect light is calculated by a computer program. And this was the first prototype we did. Um, the surface you see here has two different words encoded. The first word is one and the second word is zero. And it's like a crystal. And if you expose it to sunlight and you turn it, you have reflections on the wall. <clears throat> and these reflections are depending on how, which angle the sunlight hits it. And sometimes you just have random reflections. And here you can see it's uh, more minimalistic, a zero and a one. But these two informations are coded in the surface. And you need a medium light. You need um, a surface where it's reflecting on. And you need the right time. And the sculpture that I was proposing um, would just sit there in the middle of the plaza and during the course of the year the sun always changes its angle and each day it would have specific angles where you could read something or maybe five days in a year and on all other days you would just have uh, random reflections in the environment. The piece was never built. We just have this prototype. Um, the next piece is about the energy of information. And it's a commission for a bank in Germany. It's a large sphere made out of 1,000 mirrors. And each mirror can move very precisely and reflect sunlight. And again, I can create letters and words with it by just moving the mirrors and... Are you bored now or should I... The, the main idea behind this piece is that if you see humans, we, we take out the oil, for example, of the earth, and we use the energy to drive cars and um, big trucks. And with the big trucks, we can change the surface of the earth. And this bank is a specific bank. It has the task to um, give money to areas which are underdeveloped and has to develop um, society in a specific way. And my idea was, if I present this piece to them, it's a metaphor of uh, bringing energy from one place to a different place where there's no light, which is dark. And what the piece also is doing, it's transforming the energy into cultural values. Again, it's writing words in areas where usually no sun is going. But it's a very complicated piece and it took up more than six years to get the precision. <clears throat> and it's also an outdoor sculpture, which means it has to be waterproof and it has to withstand uh, winds and rain and ice, snow. And here you can see a movie about the calibration program. I also fast forwarded. This is the first prototype which is already thrown away. This is also a very frustrating process of building. I've now built over 10 different units that make mirrors move. And you can see, okay, I can do make dots, lines, patterns. A few days later, I could make sinus waves.
and in the end I succeeded in making very noisy words. Now I can make it much better, but that's not important. Um, I don't know if this is interesting for you. That's one of ten different mechanical solutions to move this mirror. <clears throat> In the end, I had to skip it again because it was not, it was doing okay, but here you can see us trying the piece out. And now the, the units, the mechanical units working on this prototype are very precise, but I still have a problem with the mathematical representation of the metal surface which they are mounted on. And if I only have a, an error of a tenth of a degree, I fail to make words. Uh, this is a light watch. I just want to show you one thing. <clears throat> I, I always try to be very precise and very minimalistic. And it's a long process of building these machines and I'm always frustrated. And in this night, it was at 2 o'clock in the morning, I started to say, okay, I, it's enough. And I just started to play around with the machine and with the software. And in the end, at the end of this night, maybe at half past three, we had a smiley, which is coming right next, which was a big point for me because I never did something arbitrarily or randomly before. And for me, this was a sign that I have to change in my own work. <laughs> So I, I went past this point of frustration and the next piece, it has, there has been a group in the 90s, I think in the United States, and they built small um, radio controlled cars and they attached small spray cans in the back and they were driving around the street and writing political messages. and. A friend asked me a few years ago, because he's, he did some uh, outdoor art, if I could build something for him. And I said, okay, let's buy a tractor and make the same what they did, not with, not with paint, but with water. And it's also a research on if information needs space and if it needs motion. And he was driving with this uh, tractor from, from a town in Germany to Prague. And it's very nice because the words, you can read them for maybe five minutes and afterwards they just disappear. And depending on the weather, sometimes when it's raining you cannot see anything and when it's sunny you can read it very well but just for a very, very short time. There's, there's a far better movie on YouTube um, where he's explaining the machine while he's driving to Prague. And <clears throat> it's very funny because he had to refill uh, every five hours maybe. And sometimes he, he just knocked on a door and asked for a hose pipe that somebody refills it. And it took three hours to get this big tank full. And the next, next scene is where, where he's asking the fire police in Czechoslovakia if they could refill the, the tank. And it's also about a, I don't know. Uh, I try to hurry up now and, f and finish it. Maybe we can have questions or things. Um, one more scientific piece. What you can see here are white capsules. And they are like these toy toys that always stand up again. And when you remember the first piece, Micro Adam and Micro Eva, they had only one dimension. It was gravity. It's the same here. They are only exposed to gravity, but they have two ways of leaning, two dimensions of leaning. And they can move their body to, to lean outwards and to explore their environment. And it is a group, and they are controlled with a radio transmitter. 
and now they can start to lean um, to their environment and notice when they bump into something. And the question is, is are we able to reproduce cultural behavior and what would happen to it? Now I, I, I'm, I'm too quick. I'll show you a movie. This is just a simulation. And it is simulating a behavior that I would suggest is a, like a perfect culture where everybody is communicating with each other and nobody is bumping into each other. But that's an idea that I have in my head, being brought up in, a, in Germany, very protected environment, everything is good. And then you get this image of the world or of cultural behavior. But this is just an idea that was implemented in my, my head one day. It's not my own idea. If you think about cannibalism, where people eat each other, it would be a different image. And this system is uh, um, just a, another research work on a higher level where I go beyond the own body and say, okay, what about communication? What is necessary to build up a society or a group of people that interact with each other? And you suddenly find many points, like I have to identify myself, I have to be able to identify the other one. And But here again, I need a long list and one hour to talk about just this piece. It's just an idea. <clears throat> I try to really hurry up now. Um, I try to find a system here where I can validate my own thoughts. In German language, we have the word Gedankengang, which is an English way of thought. And you also have the um, perspective or viewpoint. And I thought I could transfer my thoughts into a three-dimensional system, and I could look at the origin point of my thought and the end point of my thought, and I could measure the distance a thought produces in change of viewpoint. Therefore, I found the system where I cut aluminum cylinders in an asymmetrical way. I engrave the alphabet around it. And now I can write words with it and transform the words into a three-dimensional representation. And each word has its own form. And now what I did is I, I also have this as a program and I can type in my thoughts. And the origin of the thought is in the center of the coordinate system and it's green, and the endpoint is red. And now I can compare thoughts to each other. This one, for example, is a very bad thought. Instead, this one is a very good thought. And again, if you, look, if you give this to a, to a chemistry scientist, he says, this is a valid, um, I've forgotten it, eyewise, protein, protein sort. And this one is a sick protein. And for me, it was a, it was a way to express, uh, to validate my thoughts. But of course, there is no connection, no correlation between the meaning and the form, because it was an arbitrarily chosen system. And it's not sure if we can. I'm lost now. This is the last piece. I do the same for large philosophical texts in a two-dimensional way. And this text you're looking at now is Kant, Kritik der Vernunft. It's a very important text about philosophy. It has got 1.2 million letters, and we are very close. Each line is one letter. And my question was, if he's writing one book, very thick book with 1.2 million letters, can I feel something when I look at the text on an image? Is there a center point where he's always coming back to and talking about it, or is it a random form? And now we zoom out. Ah, and of course, it's something like a cloud, like a universe. And there's some sort of center or clusters in it. And what is, what, what is more important for me is he's describing, he's explaining the world in a philosophical way. 
And when I was looking at it, I said, okay, if I know more, I can answer more. But the border to not knowing gets bigger. Everything what is white here is what he described. And everything what is black is what he did not describe yet. And the bigger the knowledge gets, the bigger, the, the bigger he can describe better. The border to not knowing to the black space is getting bigger and bigger. Therefore, if I continue to do research and if I learn more and more and more, I will raise more and more questions. And I compared uh, Kant to different philosophers. I only show you one, which is uh, uh, Wittgenstein, Tractatus Logicus Philosophicus, which has a completely different character and different expression. <clears throat> and this is probably one of the things that explains my feelings the best. It's a closed digital nom nomad. nomad. One, a one-cell device, it's waterproof, and if you shake it, um, there's a pendulum inside it, like a Swiss watch. And this pendulum is driving a generator, and we have a battery inside, and we have a GPS receiver and a satellite uplink. And what we do is we just throw this one in the water and let it flow. And it's floating with the oceans, or with rivers, and each day when it's energy, it's sending back its GPS position. And what we just saw with uh, the text of Kant, it's like a random line wandering around. And this image is doing something similar. It's sending back lines, and I can create a world map, a natural world map that is made out of the currents of the sea and the rivers, which is completely opposite to what you have when you look on the globe, on the map. For example, in Africa, where you have 1,000 kilometers of direct separation between one nation and the other one, which is razor sharp, just one line. I don't know. I'm, I'm very confused. It's just bit many bits and pieces that I, I throw to you. And maybe we, if you have questions, because I finished now. I This is, this is my email address. If you have any comments or criti critics, I'd be happy. It's, um, it's like a Swiss, Swiss watch. And if it's moving, um, there's a pendulum inside that starts to swing. So, an <laughs> amazing uh, lecture for us, very uh, strange and uh, inspiring, uh, different from what we are used to while Comirniak. And so, it's, this is a positive uh, <laughs> aspect, I think. <laughs> so, does anybody has got some question? Thank you. I'm, I'm finishing this uh, spherical mirror piece and I'm doing more commercial works. That's one question. I don't know. I'm I'm creating new pieces but for a commercial environment because I have to earn money again. <laughs> <clears throat> and this would be a topic that I've I'm very interested in how you think an artist, how far an artist can go into advertisement and earn money. Because I found out for myself that over the last years, I've been working for 10 years now in this business. When I started off, I was on my own. I had nothing, I had only money problems. And I did only what I wanted to do. And there was only driven by my beliefs in very specific things and I was driven by finding out something. And then you enter the system of art or science or any other system and you get influenced again and you get 
driven of what you initially wanted. And now I'm at the point where I can solve technical problems. We have a large workshop with all the ma machines that you can imagine, and I can do basically whatever I want when I go there. But now I'm bound to earn money to pay all my people. And I stand there today and ask myself, is this good, is it bad? Because I have to compromise again. And what I showed you here, that's my biggest question. If I find out that I am not able to really find out something, but just to make nice looking pieces, and people are amazed by the aesthetics or by the technology, is it worth to continue to make something like this, or should I turn to a different angle again? Because today it's very easy to do something different if you have certain skills. And I'm, at the moment I'm turning more into advertisement again to try to make some money, but I have some doubts with it. No, for me, words are like keys. And it's always depending on the language system you're in. If I would have presented to you Spanish words or the culture you come from, and you read a word, this word immediately is like a key that's opening, turning something in your brain, and you start to create images. And if I would present to you an image, the image would be set. It would be the image that I I created for you and you might have some emotions with it or slightly different viewpoints but the word is a very um, comp comprimed, um, condensed, very powerful, minimalized um, piece that's unfolding in your brain and because these words always change I'm not focusing on particular words but on the change of the words and the process of change and all these machines, they use the same material over, all over to create um, different... I, for me, it's, I think it's perfect because I can create with a very small set of signs, a very large volume of imaginations and change. Is this some sort of answer? If you, if you write a small program with processing and you read a web page and you take the first word and ask the program how often does it appear, it will tell you 400 times and you don't even know that it's he or she or me and if it's appearing 400 times you can say okay I skip it, it's not important. All the words that appear very often frequently are redundant words that just connect other, other words. And if you print out a list and say, okay, Angela Merkel appears three times, and he and me and she appears 700 times, you can clearly identify by looking at the list what's important. That's what I did um, manually to select the two to seven or ten times each word appears, I display it. No, my machines know 
none of the machines has produced ever meaning. It's, um, do you mean on the scientific side or on the art side? More like in, like in the system side. When you show this, this image, you can clearly see that there is some order within the system. And I'm interested in how this order started here. Was it something with the tubes? Yes, with the tubes. It can be. Uh, should I? No, I mean, in the image you have the center of this cloud sort of pattern. Uh, was it created because of something? Uh, <clears throat> this is something I should not do because it takes the complexity of the piece, and now you will be really. It will be like. Uh, it's very, so simple. <laughs> in the middle, you have the tubes aligned in a linear structure. And what I did is, the tubes are 30 meters long or 20 meters long. And if you have them always linear, the worlds would be visible from the beginning to the end. But what I do is, I hold the middle bit and make chaos here with the tubes. And then I make chaos here with the tubes. And everybody thinks it's totally complicated. This one, yes. it's also very simple. You have the alphabet A to Z, and you have 360 degrees in a circle. And you divide the 360 degrees in a circle through the number of letters in the alphabet, and you just attach the first angle to the A, and then it goes. It's always very simple. There's no. There's never magic in it. I really don't know. <laughs> I, I said, as I said before, I, I found out during my work how limited I am, and it's getting more and more narrow. It's not a good answer, but I... <laughs> just a simple transformation from one to the other. There's no, there's no manipulation, manipulation yeah. 